chosen to read from John chapter 20 today. One sense I'm uh, deviating a little bit from my series of sermons through 1 Peter, but you might remember that as I began and introduced the letter that Peter wrote, that I did so by looking at his experiences in the Gospels. And this is another one. So Peter is one of the eyewitnesses to the empty tomb. He's one of the eyewitnesses to the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we look at this passage, we will uh, hear his testimony, and we will hear about the hope that we have because of Jesus' resurrection. I might also comment that this is just one place that this account is told. All four of the Gospels tell about the resurrection, and I've chosen this one as it does tell about Peter's experience. John 20, verse 1, this is God's word. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been, lit, had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes." I'm going to read just a little bit more. I'll preach from uh, these, these first verses, but uh, listen to uh, Mary's experience as it goes forward, too. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. Peter was an eyewitness. I want you to think just a little bit about that. When, when the Kansas City Royals won the World Series back in 2015, there was an extraordinary play at the plate. It was a daring run from third base to home that uh, dared the other team to try to throw him out, and the throw went wild. He scored. It didn't win the game immediately, but that was, that was kind of the beginning of the end that brought about the Kansas City Royals winning that national championship or the the World Series. There's a photograph of that, and it's shot from the outfield looking in, and so you can see the play at the plate, and then you can also see all of the crowd behind the plate, and the variety of expressions is priceless. There are those for the opposing team that are in agony as they see the Royals players scoring. And then you can see Royals fans jumping up and down and 
George Brett, who played for the Royals, is like this because they're winning. They're going to win the World Series. And about a month later or so, there was a reporter who went and he tracked down some of those people in the crowd, and he, and he wrote down their story, their witness of this really amazing event. But we value those firsthand stories. And I've told you of something that is, is exciting, at least it is to me, a Royals fan. Uh, eyewitnesses are important in crimes. Someone who has come, is coming in to testify is supposed to be one who has seen these things with their own eyes. Written accounts of history are best told when they go and they look at firsthand accounts and they give, uh, they give an account of what's happening. Peter was an eyewitness. Peter along with the other disciples, and notably in this passage, Mary Magdalene and a group of other women. The scriptures tell us that, uh, that doubting Thomas saw the risen Savior, and that a group of disciples, more than 500 at one time, saw the, the living Jesus Christ after the resurrection. These are eyewitness accounts. And what was written was written during the time when you could go and talk to those eyewitness accounts. You could look them up. You could go and ask them, kind of like this reporter did, and ask them to tell what they saw. Did you really see Jesus? Today I want to set before you three testimonies of the empty tomb, in this case, the empty tomb of being especially notable here as we think on Easter about that resurrection. And I want you to hear the testimony of Mary, of Peter, and of John. And I want you to hear uh, their eyewitness account of what they saw, and I want you to lead you along to see the hope of the resurrection that this brings. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We believe that he did, in fact, die as a perfect sacrifice for sin. We also believe that the grave could not hold him, that God raised him from the dead on the third day. And by the resurrection, the Lord God the Father placed his stamp of approval on that sacrifice that Jesus made, that it was indeed the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And it also declared that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So hear these three testimonies. First of all, Mary's testimony. John tells us that Mary Magdalene and other devout women woke early on the first day of the week. and They went to the tomb to honor their Lord. Part of the practice of the Jews upon burial was that a body would be anointed with oil. And so these women came to, to do this to their beloved teacher, to their friend. Now, Undoubtedly, they approached the tomb with heavy hearts. They're sad because he was dead. And there was a little bit of trepidation because they knew that once once they got there, that there were some obstacles that they were facing in order to perform these duties. One of the obstacles was that Jesus was placed into a tomb with a stone rolled in front of that. Now, we've become familiar with that phrase. We are on the other side of the resurrection. We know the stone is rolled away. But I want you to know how remarkable that that is. Our burial practice is to put a a body into the ground to cover with dirt. But the Jewish practice was often to put it into what was called a sepulcher or a tomb 
that you might walk into, like a cave. And the body would be laid there, wrapped up in cloths, wound up kind of like a mummy, and that there would be special spices and oils that would be placed on the body as a, as a sign of, of respect and as something of, a, of an honoring of that person. And that tomb would then be covered with a stone. And if you think about it, uh, it would have to be a large stone in order to cover the entrance of a cave that you may duck down into to get into, but still a, a large stone that would be rolled in front of, of that tomb. Not only that, but the Jews were afraid because they had heard Jesus say he would rise again. It's almost as if they believed more than the disciples believed because they went to Pilate and they said, you know, this rabble rouser said he was going to come back. We need to stop that. We need to stop any rumors of that. What if the disciples come at night and steal the body away and then claim that Jesus is now alive, and you have a martyr on your hands who has come back to life, a miracle. We don't want that. So Pilate said, okay, you can post a guard. You can set soldiers outside of the tomb so that no one can steal the body away. And you can put this seal on the stone so that uh, everyone will know if it's broken that some, some uh, funny business has happened. Now imagine being Mary and coming not only with a heavy heart, but wondering who will roll away the stone for us. The rest of the gospel messages uh, describe what has happened. As the women approached, Matthew says there was an earthquake and that an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, it says, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards who were still there shook for fear of him. They fell down like dead men. The angel then told them that Jesus was risen he invited them to come and to look into the tomb. Luke then tells us this, that they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. It happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen at this point, the ladies, and especially Mary Magdalene, rushed back to Jerusalem and told the disciples what they had found, or actually what they had not found. <laughs> they had not found Jesus in the tomb, and they had these mysterious words that were told to them, and their understanding was still muddled. Even though an angel had shown these things to them, and even though an angel had told them that Jesus was risen, Mary says, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. But the tomb had been sealed. The guard was set to ward against anyone stealing the body away. And it's uh, apparent that the opening of the tomb took place as these women were coming near, they were witnesses to the fact that the angel was there, was, had rolled away the stone, and that the soldiers had fallen away, heard the words, he is risen, and yet they couldn't understand that. Think of the testimony of eyewitnesses that is borne by this. Eyewitnesses that would have been able to testify that a body, the body of Jesus was laid in the tomb. 
that the stone was placed, that a seal was put on it, a guard was set. And in the morning when the stone was rolled away, the body was gone. It was so convincing that Mary uh, would go and, uh, and in distress say, where have they taken him? Where is our Savior Jesus? She comes back and wonders about this. And another angel comforts her. And another angel uh, tells her about the, uh, the, the resurrection. And then she hears and turns and sees the resurrected Jesus Christ himself. Mary says, and just with the pronouncement of her name, she recognizes him. She had, she had taken him for the gardener and said, uh, thinking that maybe he was responsible for taking the body away. But tell me where you have taken him. We need to care for his body, please. Mary. She knew him. It was Jesus. And Jesus said these things had to happen. According to Scripture, the Son of Man must suffer, die, rise again on the third day. Mary's testimony is of an empty tomb and a risen Savior. What about Peter's testimony? When Mary brought this news back to the disciples, Peter and John, and really all of the disciples were amazed, but uh, Peter and John especially ran out to the tomb. You have to love this little little detail about the account uh, that the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's the way John refers to himself, Uh, he outran Peter and got there first. (laughs) Uh, I don't know uh, exactly why that detail is put in, except I think maybe to just to add that uh, personal account so that you know this is an eyewitness that's speaking. This really happened. But Peter was the one who went into the tomb first. So I'll take his testimony first. John saw the same thing, and we'll come to that in a moment. But what did Peter find? He went into the tomb. He found that the grave clothes that had been wrapped around Jesus were still there. And not only were they there, but they were orderly, lying not in a in a hastily shredded off mess, but uh, lying in the tomb, and the cloth covering his face separately, folded neatly. Now. Let's go back and think about what was a possibility. It said that maybe somebody stole Jesus' body away. In fact, skeptics will try to convince you that this is what actually happened to Jesus' body. But that really doesn't make sense if you think about a crime scene, which is what this would have been. Think of someone breaking in past the soldiers And presumably, since there were some left in the morning, that there would be some tussle out on the outside. It's hard to imagine those grave robbers going in to desecrate the tomb by stealing the body, taking the time to unwind the dead body, as difficult as that would have been. Dead body is unwieldy unwinding it like a mummy, who knows what that would be like, and then neatening up the room as they left. Really? uh, What makes sense is that they would grab the body and run. 
if they were going to take the grave cloths off of him, surely would not take the time to neaten up the room. As Peter looks at these things, Peter comes to recognize and realize what Jesus had said to them. Pharisees had heard this. The disciples, too. Jesus had told them this is what was going to happen. The Son of Man must die at the hands of wicked men. He must suffer and die as a substitutionary atonement and rise again on the third day. And as an eyewitness of that, Peter ponders these truths. And later he too is an eyewitness of the risen Lord on several occasions. Miraculously, Jesus appears to all of the disciples, except for Thomas at this point, uh, uh, comes to them as they are behind locked doors. They're afraid that this stir might cause repercussions. If the Pharisees had employed soldiers to guard the tomb, they would surely now hunt them down as possible witnesses, possible ones who would stir up a revolt. So they were hiding. And as they were hiding behind locked doors, Jesus appeared among them. He proved to them that he was indeed alive. They saw him. They heard him. They touched him. He appeared again to Thomas in the same way. He appeared later to Peter and, and restored him after his denial. They saw the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter believed that this was indeed the Christ, the Savior of our sin, and this fact became part of the proclamation of the gospel that would go forward from Peter and then descending on down to today. We proclaim the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want you to hear what what Peter said as he preached to the thousands of Jews who were assembled at Pentecost in Jerusalem. This is just days after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Peter said this, Acts 2, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. A little bit later, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And again later, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He uses those terms very specifically to speak about the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one throughout all of the Old Testament, the one who would Lay down his life for our sins. He is that suffering servant that Peter will later teach about. The one who would, would uh, be the, uh, the, the one that would bear, but would also be raised again. Peter is an eyewitness to that. And he testifies to this in the presence of, uh, of thousands of, of, of Jews that are there. And it says that, that some 2,000 become believers on that day. How many more were there that heard and, and did not? And they could have gone to each of these witnesses to ask their testimony and to ask them what they saw and heard. 
Peter testifies that Jesus had. It was an eyewitness to this glorious event that the tomb was empty, the grave clothes left behind. The third testimony I want you to hear is John's. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. John and the other disciples finally come to understand this. They understood finally what Jesus had been telling them over and over again. And not just Jesus, but it was told in the Old Testament as well. well. The Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah must come and suffer to bear our sins. And that he must die for uh, the and, and the, the, by his shed blood that he would bring forgiveness, but that he would also be raised. You might remember that after the resurrection that Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he walked through the Old Testament showing them these things. He showed them from the law and the prophets and the Psalms why it was that the Messiah must die and rise again. And so Peter, excuse me, John could think of words like we, like we sang in Psalm 118, I shall not die, but live and tell Jehovah's power to save. This stone is made the head cornerstone, which the builders did despise. Oh, bind ye to the altar's horns with cords the sacrifice. That's Psalm 118 about Jesus' death and resurrection, or Psalm 16, which we read and sang. For you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see decay. Now, finally, he realized the truth. He saw the external evidence, and he compared it with the words of Jesus and with the written account of Scripture. He saw and he believed. He grasped the glory and the extent of what Jesus came to do. For he came to die on our behalf, to be raised again, to be our mediator. Of this, John will also write, and he later says this in John, 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. He was an eyewitness. He says that. This is what we saw. This is what we heard, what we touched and handled. We tell them to you so that you too may believe. That you may be part of the joy of of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Your joy may be full. So what will you do with these eyewitness accounts? You can add to Mary and Peter and John a number of different accounts. If you'd like to read some more, Uh, Go and read 1 Corinthians 15 this afternoon. You read the Apostle Paul and what he said about his seeing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the risen Savior Jesus and of the importance of the resurrection. Go and read what he says about that. You can add to it the, the 500 that saw him, the two on the road to Emmaus, and James's brother, They all proclaim the truth, as Peter did on the day of Pentecost. 
that this Jesus is Lord and Savior. This Jesus, who was crucified, is risen. He is the only way of salvation. Skeptics will try to explain it away. You might even today be shaking your head saying, this is incredible. How in the world can I believe this? Surely there's some explanation. We know medically that it's impossible for dead bodies to come back. It just is impossible. Well, you have eyewitnesses that say differently. You'll need to do something with their testimony. You'll need to come to grips with that. You can scoff it off. You can uh, turn away. But if you do, you are left in an uncomfortable position. It's an uncomfortable position denying eyewitness accounts in the first place. But it leaves you experientially in a very uncomfortable place. For it is only in Jesus Christ that there is any hope of everlasting life. That's the only way of salvation, the only way. And without the resurrection, you are left with some vague wishing or hoping that your future might be better. But it won't. Jesus, the sacrificed, crucified, risen, ascended Jesus, is the only way of salvation. Will you believe in him? Will you trust in him? Peter comes to write of this as well in his first letter. I'll refer you back to a sermon on 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 5. I won't preach that again, but I'll read those verses. Hear them in the context of Peter being an eyewitness. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last day. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the Christian hope that we believe in. It has evidential reason underneath it. The eyewitness accounts that are recorded here. It has the testimony of Jesus himself foretelling what was going to happen. It has the textual evidence of Scripture all throughout telling what must happen, what did happen, and the hope that that brings to us. Will you believe in Jesus? Pray that you would. Find the hope of everlasting life in our resurrected Lord. Let's pray. O God, having heard these eyewitness accounts, having seen how they agree with what Jesus said and what the Scripture writes, I pray that we would understand the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, how that signals hope to our lost souls. Lord, I pray that that testimony would go out from us today by our lives and by our words May we carry that glad news, even as Mary did, to the disciples. He is risen. May we carry that to those around us. And may that joy be a joy that others join into. 
that they may know what is seen and heard and handled, that Jesus is alive, and that there is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and him alone. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing once more of our joy of everlasting life and the resurrection. It's recorded in Psalm 113a. Psalm 113a. Let's stand to praise the Lord. <laughs> 